Good morning, Phoenix, and welcome to the House of Mystery radio show. And this is the place to come for true crime, conspiracy, and alternative history. Only on KFNX 1100 Independent Talk Radio. We're here every Saturday morning, 6 to 7 a.m., and I'm your host, Al Warren. Welcome back to the House of Mystery on KFNX Phoenix. And um, today the question is Watergate. Um, For the people that uh, remember or don't remember, uh, was there a break-in? And um, was there recordings? Was there electronic bugs? That's the question we're covering today. And uh, joining us is an author and uh, researcher called Ashton Gray. And his book is Watergate, The Hoax. Uh, thanks very much for being on the show. It's an honor and a pleasure, Al. Well, it's uh, it's our honor. You're doing the work. We're just uh, we're just talking to you about it. So, uh, um, I appreciate it. Uh, so, um, let's let's start out with who you are, because of course I don't think my listeners have heard you before. So, um, how did you get to, to write about Watergate, and um, and where did you come from? Well, I come from the South, and that's about all I care to say, if you don't mind. I, I don't want this to be about me. It's about the facts that were uncovered in this investigative report. And um, I, I'm an independent researcher and author. I have written or ghost-written seven books. I've done work for clients such as uh, Random House and Universal Studios. And it was through some of my research on a variety of other works that I I became aware of the incomprehensible contradictions in the, quote, confessions of the Watergate perp. And these these are things that authors and investigators and triers of fact have wrestled with ever since it happened. No one's ever been able to make sense out of it. And the reason is because it's fiction. It's nonsensical. And it it was a a scripted pack of lies. There's not a scrap of evidence anywhere to support any of the, quote, confessions of the perpetrators. And in fact, the only physical evidence there is completely negates um, their claims. (laughs) So it was a fascinating uh, subject to me. And when we started pulling the Strings, and I say we because I had a, several colleagues who were invaluable in this research. The research has spanned 20 years. It resulted in a database of over 13,000 entries from over 2,000 sources, including um, the Watergate hearings, um, various congressional committees, all the testimony of the perpetrators, and every book that's been written on Watergate we could scratch up. So uh, it's been a long, hard road, but the book is finally out, and and, uh, everyone involved is very proud of it. Yeah. Uh, How was was it when you were doing any research for this to put your book together? Um, Was there a resistance to the way way you thought and what you were writing about? Because you're you're calling it the hoax. So uh, did, did people not like to hear that? No, nobody liked to hear it initially. But the facts, you know, we went through all of the FBI reports on the Watergate um, uh, scandal, for instance. We have copies of those, and they've been combed through for minute details from, from, um, well, from witnesses that others have never even interviewed. And the picture that emerged, it flew into the face, into the teeth, really, of what is a Watergate religion, and I don't know any other analogy for it. You see, these confessions 
um, by Hunt, Liddy, McCord, the, the so-called Cuban contingent, all of whom were connected with the CIA. Everyone who's investigated this or written about it has started with the premise that their confessions were true. That was accepted as an article of faith, and I mean faith. It is a religious belief, and this book goes right into the teeth of it, and believe me, there was plenty of resistance. Oh, Everyone yeah. involved with this, with this investigation, though, and, and the writing and editing of this work w had made a vow, we will go where the data leads. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I bet. So uh, let's lay out, what was the uh, Watergate considered to be? Like, what, what's, what was it supposed to be? Well, let's just, I'll give a brief rundown of the, quote, official story. Supposedly, over Memorial Day weekend, 1972, that was the 26th, 27th, 28th of, of May, 1972, E. Howard Hunt, G. Gordon Liddy, James McCord, and this pack of, um, of, of Cuban CIA operatives who had been involved in the Bay of Pigs made three attempts to break in to the Democratic National Headquarters in the Watergate building. Um, the first two, so they claim, failed. The first one was on Friday night, the 26th. It was called the Emeritus Dinner, uh, where they were in the Continental Room of the uh, Watergate complex. And they supposedly were going to sneak in from that room into the building. That failed. Then, supposedly, there was another attempt on Saturday night, and then they claimed that they actually broke in Sunday night and that James McCord had planted two electronic bugs. Um, then th their story was that one of the bugs was mal uh, defective. It was malfunctioning. And so on 17 June, they went back in, quote, unquote, claiming that was a second break-in. And the reason, well, they give several re reasons, none of which make sense, but one was to replace this defective bug. And that's when they were arrested. And that's when the scandal broke and Nixon started trying to cover it all up. But it was, it was a hoax. There never was a first break-in. There were no bugs planted in the, um, in the headquarters, and there were no logs by Alfred Baldwin. Hmm. So, so then what was the whole purpose to it? I mean, uh, Nixon, in essence, lost his job over it. So what, what, what really happened then? What really happened is that Liddy, Hunt, and McCord had to have an absolute ironclad alibi for Memorial Day week in 1972. They were on a, on a, all the evidence militates toward a conclusion that they were on a much dirtier, much more vile mission. But they had to have a, an alibi that no one would ever question. That's why on the 17th of June, several weeks later, McCord made sure there was visible tape on the doors so that the security guard, Frank Wills, would alert the police and... Um, Schaffler, the detective named Schaffler, who had come out of the National Security Agency before he joined the D.C. police force, had stayed hours past his shift because he was in on it and he was going to be the arresting officer for a lot of reasons that the book covers. I can't go into all the details. But the entire purpose of the 17 June break-in was actually so they would get caught and then uh, Alfred Baldwin followed by all the rest of them, would start confessing this, this stupid spy fiction script, probably written by E. Howard Hunt, who was a spy fiction, pulp fiction writer, and claimed that they had been breaking in over Memorial Day weekend. They were ready to take a fall for this, quote, third-rate burglary for a, a minor sentence, and most of them um, served their time in, you know, country club, prison. Um, so no one would ever find out what they were really doing over Memorial Day weekend. Well, that's, you know, um, 
so what was the purpose of the cover up in that? Like, so that it was just put on for a show, is what you're saying? Yes, yes, it was. They Nixon was collateral damage. He was framed because he had to go because of what the CIA had planned. And what the CIA had planned, I'll get right to it, happened on 1 October 1972. It was exactly two weeks to the day after the indictments were handed down on the Watergate um, defendants. And it was um, the CIA's <coughs> um, Office of Technical Services Contract 8473. It was issued to a man named Hal Puttoff, who also had come out of the National Security Agency. It was for a, an expanded effort in parapsychology, and it's what became known as remote viewing. The three core personnel were Al Puttoff, Ingo Swan, and a man named Pat Price. And do you know what all three of them had in common? No. They all had gone into Scientology and gone up to its top uh, its secret top levels called Operating Satan. Two of them were OT or OT levels. Two of them were OT7. One of them was OT3. Um, and they are the ones who started the remote viewing program for the CIA under a very secret contract. Nixon never would have stood for it. Nixon hated Hub L. Ron Hubbard and Scientology. He had to be removed, and Agnew had to be gotten rid of, too, so that Ford, Gerald Ford, who was in on the whole operation, and Nelson Rockefeller, who also was in on it, could be installed as president and vice president and oversee the beginning of the remote viewing program. Okay, so was, so they were uh, they were supportive of remote viewing, and Scientology. So were they Scientologists themselves, like Ford? No, no, no. But they were completely convinced by the CIA and the DIA, the, the Defense Intelligence Agency, that this was a guaranteed way to gain a monopoly supremacy over parapsychology. They were utterly convinced. Now, some people who I think are not quite bright have claimed, oh, it's just a coincidence that Hal Puttoff, Ingo Swan, and Pat Price were all Scientologists. Uh, we took this to a noted mathematician and asked him to compute the odds of the CIA just happening to pick three people who all were Scientology OTs. The math is covered in the book. I won't go through it. I'll just tell you the results. It came out to odds of one in two hundred trillion. Wow! So they had agenda. The agenda was Scientology, and um, and here's the problem: L. Ron Hubbard had absolutely forbidden anyone connected with an intelligence agency from any nation in the world ever getting hold of this technology. So. He was a, as big an obstacle, a, a bigger obstacle, really, than Nixon. Uh, so how did they get particulars out of um, Scientologists and those people? So they were kind of working around L. Ron Hubbard? They had to have been. He would have never stood for it. As a matter of fact, it, one of the, the investigative trails we went down, and it went through a lot of blind alleys, was how in the world did Ingo Swan, who had secret and top secret clearances and, and had worked for the UN when he first got connected with the CIA secretly, nobody knew he was connected with them, and Hal Puttoff, who had been in the NSA, had top secret clearances, how in the world did they get past the security measures of Scientology and Hubbard to get access to these upper levels? Well, all of the evidence piles up to point to a, a lady named Hannah Eltringham, who has been become a very vocal critic of Hubbard and Scientology after having come out of the Sea Organization, which was a Scientology organ, management organization. 
but she was in it. And at the time that Swan and Putoff were connected, had were coming into Scientology, she was the head of the advanced organization in Los Angeles. She's from the Commonwealth, and, and we, we have a whole chapter on um, the Commonwealth and the Five Eyes, it's called. It's the allies of the CIA, of, our, of the United States intelligence branches, and how it appears that they infiltrated the Scientology organizations and got in positions very close to Hubbard. And Altrincham, as far as we can tell, uh, opened the back door and let Cutoff and Swan get onto these upper levels of uh, somehow possibly hiding their actual connections to the intelligence agencies. So um, Scientology today is not what it was back then, is what you're saying, too. Oh, my, my next book, the sequel to this book, is called Stargate the Hoax, covers how all of the organizations of Scientology were utterly destroyed. Um, they were replaced by these this Byzantine structure of interlocking corporations that was architected by, I'll sit down for this one if you're not, a man named Mead Emery, who had been an assistant to the commissioner of IRS while the Scientology organizations were being torn down by the federal government. And he set it up so that on Hubbard's reported official death, all of Hubbard's intellectual property was dumped into this corporation called the Church of Spiritual Technology. It's a fraud because it's not a church at all, according to a United States court ruling. It was doing business under a fraudulent name called the L. Ron Hubbard Library, but instead of making a library for his work, they were busy burying his works underground in in underground vaults that have titanium doors. Anybody can search this out on the Internet. I, I couldn't make this up if I wanted to. And that's where his original works are right now. The public cannot see them. And the Church of Spiritual Technology, in, in connection with uh, the religious whatever, the RTC, under David Miscavige, has been putting out altered versions of the works. So no, it, it's not recognizable as what Scientology was prior to 1972. Wow. So uh, I, I guess, uh, now do all of the Scientologists know about this, or are they aware of this, or does it matter? Well, it matters a lot. I, don't, I can't speak for um, current Scientologists. I can tell you that there's a huge... Um, well, it's sort of a movement of people who left Scientology back after the 70s and 80s uh, because they wanted nothing to do with the way the organization was starting to um, operate, including, for example, the Rehabilitation Project Force, called the RPF. It is absolutely hated by the public. Well, it's no wonder Hubbard didn't start it. I, I think he was dead as a hammer or had been incapacitated with psychiatric practices such as uh, lobotomy, drugs, um, possibly electric shock. I think that's what was done to him after Memorial Day weekend, 1972. Uh, I don't think he had any control over the organizations after that date. But a guy named Kenneth Urquhart, who also was from one of the Commonwealth nations and was, had gotten himself into a very high position, wrote it, and he wrote it with um, another guy who had been trained by CIA operatives in brainwashing and in um, what Hubbard called black dianetics. It, it's, used, it's the use of it to drive people down and suppress them which he was, of course, entirely against. Um, so it's, it's quite a story. It's beyond anything that could be written as fiction, 
But we have this so thoroughly cited, I think there's some, well, it's way up in the high hundreds of footnotes or endnotes in the electronic versions of FBI reports and CIA, FOIA documents. And um, this is what it looks like to us. It's, it's 620 pages in worth in the trade paperback. Well, wow, that's pretty amazing. So you don't think that... Um the remote viewing by the government would have been set up if it wasn't for the Scientology part of it? Well, it certainly would not have been done the way it was done. They were frantic. They were. Uh, the book talks about the motive, and it's called The Coldest War, The Battle for Men's Souls. The previous chapter, chapter 10, covers the battle for men's minds, and, and you, of course, are familiar with Operation Bluebird and Artichoke and MK Ultra, right. the mind control uh, initiatives set up by the person I call the Butcher of Langley, Richard Helms, and his uh, sort of Igor sidekick, <laughs> Sidney Godleib. They were just um, amoral. They had no conscience about what they did to people. And, but, can I read a real brief thing from a a Defense Intelligence Agency uh, publication from 1972. Oh, for sure. It says, The major impetus behind the Soviet drive to harness the possible capabilities of telepathic communication, telekinetics, and bionics are said to come from the Soviet military and the KGB. Today it is reported that the USSR has 20 or more centers for the study of parapsychological phenomena with an annual budget estimated, and it says $21 million, but that works out to over, 100, uh, over $119 million in 2015 dollars. The USSR, it's sometimes difficult for people to get the context of what happened in 1972. Um, the USSR was making a major push to get control over parapsychology, now, I think, and we will never know unless the CIA is dismantled brick by brick and all their files are spilled out in the street, which is what I think should be done by our government. But um, I think the remote viewing itself is a cover-up. I think their primary interest in Ingo Swan was his telekinetic abilities because he did a variety of experiments where he was affecting thermos stores in sealed containers at a distance, and he could do it on command repeatedly. But then he went to the Varian Hall of Science at Stanford Research Institute, and in the presence of witnesses, several of whom no doubt were CIA, he affected a magnetometer that was encased in like six feet below him in solid concrete and on command made the, the uh, printout of it, the readout, the, the needle on the chart jump all over the place. It was unheard of, and it was utterly impossible without him having some ability to affect matter and energy at a distance. So the CIA was very interested in this. Think of the implications for nuclear uh, weapons. Hmm. So, <laughs> wow. And w wasn't Russia involved in the same thing? Yeah, I was just reading that thing from the defense. That was from the Defense Intelligence Agency about the Soviets, about their twenty center, twenty or more centers for the study of parapsychology. And they had videos of some women who uh, demonstrated telekinetic abilities. So yes, that's I was. I was reading that to say why the CIA and the DIA were so terrified and so determined to do anything they had to to gain a monopoly over um, over any technology that could give them the upper hand. And see, Hubbard came out with, he announced, for instance, OT6. When he announced the ability gained, he probably signed his death warrant. And it was, and it's real short, it says, quote, 
ability to operate freely as a Satan, T-A-T-T-A-N, that was his word for the spirit, you know, the soul, uh, what, what we call, well, what religions call the spirit or the soul. It's the spiritual being separate from his mind or his body. So he says, ability to operate freely as a Satan exterior and to act pan-determinedly extends the influence of the Satan to the universe of others. Well, this was the holy grail for the KGB and the CIA. A, a being who could perceive remotely, who could affect others remotely, who could affect matter, energy, space, and time remotely. It's sort of a controlled, out-of-body experience at will. And so Nixon was not involved in, and probably wouldn't, support this kind of uh, program, you think? Well, one of our chapters is called The Nixon Problem, and it's a quote, it's a long uh, write-up by L. Ron Hubbard himself saying what, what had happened when Nixon had sent Secret Service agents into one of the Scientology organizations and harassed the staff and how Nixon absolutely hated Hubbard and Scientology. I mean, there's even a quote at the top of the chapter from L. Ron Hubbard that says, Nixon hates us. Why was Nixon so hateful of them? Like, what, what did they do? Um, was it just uh, he was worried about how much power they would have? I cannot account for uh, everything everybody does. I'm right. sorry. Yeah. The, the biases and bigotry in this world are a frightening thing to behold and usually are incomprehensible. I can't say exactly. I know that Hubbard had written something and he mentioned Nixon in passing. Uh, we cover that in the book, too. I don't remember the exact details of what he had said, but it had really upset Nixon. And Nixon actually sent... Uh, this is when Nixon was the vice president under Eisenhower. And um, Nixon sent Secret Service people in to harass them. Wow. <laughs> yes. <laughs> wow. Wow. But it, it's an indi it was an indication of the bad blood between them, and Nixon never would have stood for the CIA using Scientology tech, the top, the highest level Scientology technology as its number one um, black program, you know, its top secret program to try to get supremacy over the Soviets. Yeah. So the CIA is really kind of um, what what you're saying is kind of the uh, the construct, the kind of um, lead in this whole thing. Absolutely. It was a CIA operation start to finish. Even G. Gordon Liddy had special clearances from the CIA. James McCord had been in the CIA almost since its inception. Um, e. Howard Hunt had definitely been in the CIA since its inception. They were long in the tooth veterans. They were picked for this job because it was dirty. And as far as we can tell, the job they did over Memorial Day weekend was done in concert with King Hassan II of Morocco. You know, um, Colby, uh, the, the later CIA director, after the remote viewing thing had started, once said in an Oval Office, uh, talk that, that was recorded, he said um, CIA I, he said, I'm sorry, he said Watergate was a code word and people have never really understood what he could have meant well I think we found the answer in the book because L. Ron Hubbard at the time was in Tangier, Morocco and for centuries Tangier has been known as the gate way to the Mediterranean, a huge body of water, um, a very famous and important body of water. And that was the real water gate, because Tangier was where the actual staging was taking place over Memorial Day weekend. Um, we believe it was with Hunt, Liddy, and McCord, and they were working in concert with King Hassan II, who claimed to be a direct descendant of the Prophet Muhammad. Um, 
Scientology and Hubbard were quite a threat to Islam. And the deputy director of the CIA, at the time all this went down, was a man named Vernon Walter, and he was a lifelong friend of Hassan II. He had landed in Morocco during World War II and had given the young prince, then, then prince Hassan II, a ride on his tank. So there's that connection. And then uh, Hassan II's chief henchman was, was General Ufkir, O-U-F-K-I-R, and I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly, but who knows how it's pronounced over there. And he had a very dirty past, and there's evidence that people who were close to Hubbard were interacting with Ufkir and setting up his abduction over Memorial Day weekend to be incapacitated or killed. Wow. So E. Howard Hunt and, and, and Liddy knew what they were doing? Um, I, I have no shred of doubt that they knew what they were doing. And they were not anywhere near Washington, D.C. over that Memorial Day weekend. Uh, their claims that they were are lies. And the whole you know, dog and pony show that weekend that was pulled off by uh, Bernard Barker and uh, Frank Sturgis and the other, uh, and well, Sturgis wasn't Cuban, but the rest of them were, who were, had had been long connected with the CIA. One of them, uh, Martinez, was actually on the CIA p- payroll right when the, the, they were arrested. So, it unquestionably was a CIA operation. And on the night of the arrest, they planted so much F- traceable evidence to lead to Hunt and Liddy, and it was done so they could frame the White House. That's why Hunt and Liddy had been moved into positions um, close to the White House and to Nixon's reelection campaign. And that's why they scattered evidence everywhere to point to. <laughs> it was a total frame up, and Nixon was like a deer in headlights. If you can listen to all those Oval Office conversations, he doesn't know come here from Sikkim. He doesn't know what's going on. And that's exactly where Helms and the CIA wanted him. So, of course, when he was induced by John Dean to start making payments, to start covering this up, he fell for it, and it was over for him. Wow. So now on the other side of it, um, how about Deep Throat, you know, who was uh, Mark Felt? And, uh, oh, wait, oh, Al. Yep. Assume a Deep Throat not in evidence. I'd have to ask you to prove that Mark Felt was Deep Throat. Well, well that I can't do. <laughs> exactly. You know why? why? You know what the motto of my book is? Fiction doesn't leave a paper trail. And that's the problem. You know, again, we have Woodward's, quote, confession that it was Mark Fell. Mm -hmm. By the time they trotted this out, this story had already started to break in various places that Watergate was a hoax. And um, they they were shaken. They had to trot somebody out, so they got a guy who had just had a stroke and couldn't even speak for himself. And they probably had enough. It's fiction. There was no deep throat. There's not a scrap of evidence that there was ever anyone called deep throat. It's just more confessions, confessions, confessions. I told you the only evidence there was uh, is directly contradictory to what these people have claimed. You know, on the day of the arrest, the Chesapeake and something, I have it in the book, but a uh, telephone company who had installed the telephone system in the Democratic National Committee headquarters in Watergate, came in and did a whole sweep of the thing. They didn't find a single bug. About a week or two later, the FBI laboratory came in, did a complete sweep. They said there was not a single bug anywhere in that place. So there never were any bugs. And that's the only fit, absolute solid evidence we have. It's, it's two independent investigators um, or agencies 
went and inspected the place for electronic devices, and there were none. So this whole thing, Woodward and Bernstein are comedians. Um, All the President's Men is fiction. It's the, quote, official story. And the organization they worked for, the Washington Post, was, and probably is, but definitely was at the time, part of a CIA operation called um, Operation Mockingbird. They had the um, owners and managers of all the major media, the TV networks, major newspapers like the Post, the New York Times, the Chicago Tribune, and all the big newspapers in their pocket. They were propaganda. Um, All those newspapers were propaganda arms of the CIA. This is well documented, too. Other people have covered this extremely well. Anybody can look up Operation Mockingbird, even in Wikipedia. (laughs) Well, that's who Woodward and Bernstein worked for, and Woodward himself, see, Schaffler, this detective that did the arrest, uh, Putoff, who who was in the NSA, Schaffler was working for at uh, this this NSA installation when he came out and joined the police force. Putoff came out, went into Scientology. Well, Woodward was in naval intelligence with clearances. He came out and went and joined the um, post just in time to cover all this. Wow. So, so then. How do, how do Woodward and Bernstein fit into it? So were they Scientologists, or were they aware of this, or were they just being used? No, they weren't Scientologists. They were involved. They were in with the intelligence age, uh, network. Oh, okay, okay. So they were, yeah, I know Woodward. I have, certain, I have a moral certainty for myself. Woodward was involved. He knew what was going down, or at least, he knew enough on a need-to-know basis, and he played his role. He, you know, his, that whole stupid thing that came out in the movie version, at least, of all the president's men, you know, follow the money, yeah. that's the biggest red herring there was. As covered in the book thoroughly, nobody can follow the money because it was distributed to the perpetrators in, in brown paper bags. And it was, it, nobody knows where the cash came from or how much was handed out to them. Um, e. Howard Hunt's wife, Dorothy Hunt, was the courier to transfer a lot of cash. And see, there's this whole other story about a $12 million, approximately $12 million, coming from a Swiss account to the Scientology flagship in Tangier, um, called the Apollo, shortly before all this cash started getting handed out in the United States to the Watergate perks. And one person traveled from Tangier to New York uh, to New York at a time when he could have been a courier for that cash. So um, nobody can follow the money, but that was, you know, that's part of this Fantastic fiction in in all the pres in all the presidents in. Wow! So, uh, right now you're saying that Woodward and uh, would know really what's going on. That's my opinion. That's your opinion, right? And uh, I, it's it's what I consider an informed opinion. Right. Uh, right. Anybody who can read the the book Watergate: The Hoax and come away with any other opinion. I'd be happy to speak to them. I'd be happy to hear their case. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So this does this tie in, and, and are you thinking that the CIA has a lot to do with what happened to Kennedy and perhaps even things that are going on today in the world? I have to not reach to the Kennedy assassination. Um, I, that's covered so thoroughly by so many very competent researchers, and I don't. I don't know how what happened to Kennedy could have been pulled off at all without the CIA involvement, but I am not an expert on that. Um, there's a there's a forum co- about the JFK assassination at a place called the Education Forum, and it has some world class experts on it who post there and who have written books. So I would have to defer to them entirely on that question. But I 
put in my afterward that it's my opinion that the CIA is the largest, single largest criminal organization that's ever existed on this planet. Of course, they run these kinds of operations um, all the time. And, well, who they work for, I've touched on at least a little bit in the book, but they can hide any activity behind so-called, quote, national security, unquote. But they're, you know, they have a track record of proven liars and and involved in criminal assassinations, murder, extortion, blackmail. I, I don't know. I mean, I don't. If you had a neighbor who did a thousand of the things that the CIA does with alacrity and with no oversight and no consequences, I bet you'd move. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's uh, not a good thing. <laughs> and these are the people who are in charge of our quote national security. It's terrifying. Hey, now, have you heard anything? Now, this book just came out May twenty eighth. Um, yes. What's the response been? And have you heard anything from anybody involved in in the the Watergate scenario? No, I haven't. I haven't. <laughs> if, if if they sent it to Chalet Book. The editors there probably wouldn't bother to forward it to me. <laughs> so you're, probably, but you're not worried? Contacted. But no, they haven't contacted me. The response I've gotten, you know, that I have received an email. We've had some wonderful uh, letters, email uh, come in. A parent, uh, you know, there's some real ankle biters, to, you know, venom spewers that, that rival the alien creature, an alien, <laughs> yeah, dripping venom. You know, I think there's been a little, little bit of that <laughs> too on the internet. But it's creating controversy, and I think the controversy is very healthy. I think it's time people started questioning things and and insisting on real answers and stop. You know, we just get sold a bill of goods, and we're supposed to just accept it. It's time, I think, that we wake up, take back our nation from criminals and and um, people who have less than pure intention and really try to get ourselves back on track with integrity and with honesty and with the, the heritage that this nation was founded on. Are you worried about um, backlash from the CIA, or do you worry for your safety? No, I have, um, and they could probably do anything they wanted to do at any time, so there's no point in my worrying about it. Uh, there were a lot of security measures over the course of the last 20 years while this information was being compiled. And it wasn't just me that I had concern for. As I said, there are quite a few colleagues who have been involved in the uh, compilation and analysis of this information. It's, it's been a big task. They were scattered all, all around the world and still are. So all I am is the scribe. I, I am honored that I've been allowed to have access to all this information and been able to put it into what I hope is a cohesive package. It was the hardest thing I've done in my life, it, trying to make sense out of fiction, out of vicious fiction, out of a pack of lies, trying to talk about things that never happened in order to prove the point that they never happened. But so many people believe it, as I said uh, early on, it, it's an article of faith that there was a first break-in. And once you accept that premise, you're sunk. They got you. You've been had. And and that's where every former investigator or trier of fact or author has started. And that's why they've run into so many blind alleys and they can't figure out. The, uh, the favorite indoor sport for years was trying to figure out who actually ordered that first break-in. Well, when you know it was a hoax, the answer is obvious. 
Nobody did. There wasn't one. Now, do you, is this remote viewing thing still going on? Um, I mean, officially it's supposed to be shut down. Yeah, officially. And so who knows? Officially it wasn't happening for, tw- tw- I think, 25 years, but it was. So, <laughs> again, it's like these these people can hide anything they want to. They have an almost unlimited black budget. They can... Um, I, I have no way of knowing. Yeah, yeah. I wish I, I wish I could give you a magic answer, but probably one of those magic eight balls could answer you just as well. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so now, now your next thing, you're you're going to be doing the Stargate hoax. Uh, what's yeah. what's kind of the premise of that to look forward to? Well, it covers the um, two parallel tracks mainly, the track of the evolution of the um, remote viewing program, as well as we know. See, so much of it is still classified. But I have no question in my mind, from the information available, that part of the CIA and DIA's operation was to put out phony versions, you know, as disinformation. We still don't know what they were using or what they were doing, but there's a there's a uh, only a one in two hundred trillion <laughs> chance that what it was was anything but Scientology. Uh, but the parallel track is what happened to Scientology, and was Hubbard alive? Was he incapacitated? Who was running his affairs? Who was running the organization? Who was putting out all these bear these these um, policies and writings and what have you that were 180 degrees contrary to everything he'd done up until 1972. And it's the story of how the FBI and the United States government tore down Scientology's guardian's office, um, destroyed the Hubbard Association of Scientologists, which had owned the copyrights, and effectively stole all the copyrights and the trademarks, dumped them into this shell corporation, and now, just so you know, nothing can be put out under the name of the Scientology religion. It's not even just called Scientology anymore. They had to change it to a legal entity called, quote, the Scientology religion. That's the exact name, but, but they keep this kind of hidden. But the IRS has to approve everything that is published by the organizations. Wow. So so they've changed themselves. Uh, well, the IRS is running it, essentially. Right. They have fine say. Like, okay, this can go out. Yeah, this can be published. This can be... Yes. I mean... It's it's incredible, but I've got the document that says so. I've got the government document <laughs> that says this, and it's cited in the book. Stargate the Hoax is largely finished, but it's going to go through a number of revisions, and it's being shared with a number of people around the world who are are, are helping me shape and form it. But it's it's largely written. It'll probably come out uh, around this time next year. Wow, that's that's pretty amazing. Um, so, what what do you think about things that are happening today? Um, is it all kind of related to this? You know, with CIA and and uh, Scientology. Well, Al, the only way I can answer that is to say that Watergate, nineteen seventy two, but it was a watershed event for this nation and for Scientology. Both, in my estimation, have been on a long downhill slide ever since. Um, the, the, it wasn't just Nixon was compromised. I mean, he had enough blood on his hands. I, I haven't shed any tears for Nixon, but um, the office of the presidency was compromised. The integrity of the office the honor of the office was severely compromised by that act, by this 
hoax run by the Central Intelligence Agency. It was a coup d'etat that happened that year in the United States with the CIA essentially taking over. And, um, yeah, Scientology was taken over, too. It's not what it was. So I can't speak to your question beyond that. I think it's very sad what's happened to both because um, in my research, it seems that that Hubbard genuinely uh, good. He was about the hardest working man I've ever I've ever studied about. The amount of just sheer amount of output of writing and and the number of, like three over three thousand public lectures. That by the way stopped just before Memorial Day weekend, nineteen seventy two. He never gave another one, but people have called him a con artist. And I just laugh. I, I laugh right out loud. It's like, if he was, he was the stupidest, hardest-working con artist he ever was. He, he, he's got world records for just the sheer volume of writing. And it seems to me, from the little bit, good land, it's more than I can read, but he, he really had a benign purpose. He wanted to elevate mankind, to, to help raise man spiritually to realize his full potential and toward greater and greater freedom. So I think there was a lot of destruction. What The biggest crime the CIA committed in 1972 was against the storehouse of man's knowledge. And I think that's the biggest crime that can be committed. Um, we only advance with the knowledge we've gained uh, as, a, as, as a species. Well, Ashton, thank you very much for uh, being on the show. Oh, I can't thank you enough for having me. I, I hope that these truths will be, will be gotten out there into the world. That's why I did this. And, and I really appreciate you giving me the opportunity to speak them. And I hope people will, will reach to the book and see the full documentation of what's been written. And I, uh, I'm as grateful as I can be for your having me on the show. Well, we appreciate it. Again, the book is called Watergate, The Hoax, and the author is Ashton Gray. Thanks very much for being on the show. The show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of the Z-Talk Radio Network. I'll be back.